For my layered chocolate orange cake, I'm starting with a classic chocolate sponge. For this, I'm using unsalted butter that's at room temperature, so it will cream up and be lovely and aerated. I'm using a combination of two sugars, a golden caster sugar and a light soft brown sugar, which will give a wonderful moistness to the cake. The zest of fresh oranges, fresh eggs, which are at room temperature, and then I have self-raising flour, which I'm going to add some additional baking powder to to get wonderful lift and aeration on the cake, and then dark chocolate cocoa. I've got some milk on the side so I can adjust the consistency of the batter before it goes into the tin to make sure that the cake that I bake will be perfect. I'm going to start by creaming the butter so that it's nice and soft before I add the sugar. It's really important to have the ingredients at room temperature because that will ensure that they emulsify and aerate to the best that they can. It's really important when you're baking to ensure that you maximize your ingredients. So unsalted butter, sugar. What I tend to do is weigh the ingredients out the night before so that they can really come up to room temperature and be perfect ready to start baking. So I'm creaming together the butter and the sugar. Now it's not possible to over cream. So you can literally set this going while you go and get everything else ready. Line the tins, make a cup of tea, put the kettle on, and then when you come back to it, it should be beautifully light and aerated. Not possible to over cream. If you're looking for the point where you can't see any of the granules of sugar, that they've really almost dissolved inside the butter, and you get this wonderful light, mousse-like texture of an aerated batter. I wanted to show you this because you'll see that when the cake has reached, the batter has reached its right creaming stage, you'll see it's really light and, and aerated. And you want to make sure that you've just scraped through so that all of the butter, all of the sugar has been, has been well incorporated. This whole point is about creating an emulsion. So it's a stable solution of where the butter and the sugar have emulsified together and they're nice and light and aerated. And that's the point at which I can start adding the eggs. The purpose of the eggs is twofold. They should be at room temperature because an egg is an elasticated protein, so it will absorb more air if it's at room temperature because it can stretch further. The egg white will aerate and that will hold lots of air into the cake, so the warmer it is and the longer you spend adding this to the egg, the more lovely, light, fluffy air will be inside the cake. But the egg yolk itself is a wonderful emulsifying agent, so that helps to hold everything nice and stable and create a very stable batter. So that's why I like to whisk them together first. So you're adding, when you're adding it slowly in a nice sort of even trickle, you can make sure that you have much more control about adding this liquid in a nice, slow, steady stream. So if you whisk those together first, with a little hand whisk, you've got a nice even liquid, which makes it easier when it comes to pouring in and adding to the batter.
you should find that if you've added the eggs slowly enough, you've weighed everything accurately enough and everything was at room temperature, by the time they've been incorporated into the batter, you should have this wonderful mixture that's not curdled in any way, shape or form. And now it's ready to have the flour added and the fresh oranges. I've mixed together the flour, the baking powder and the cocoa and I'm going to sieve those straight into the mixture over the bowl. This will ensure that they're all nicely incorporated and taken out any of the lumps that may be in the flour or the cocoa ready for mixing. It's important to fold the flour into the mixture because you don't want to beat out all that air that you just spent uh, a long time incorporating. So to fold it carefully, you hold the bowl, take the rubber spatula or the metal spoon around the outside of the mixture and then cut through. This takes time and I always say, you know, hold your breath when you're folding in the, the flour because you want to make sure that you are just creating the lightest of sponges. The purpose of using flour and cocoa powder at this stage is to, well for the cocoa is to flavour it so you get that nice chocolatey flavour in the cake. But for the flour is for its starch properties. So it ensures that when the cake bakes, it will set, the starch granules burst, they hold the moisture and you get a wonderful even crumb structure. If you start to beat the cake at this stage or use a wooden spoon to stir the flour in, what you're doing is you're activating the gluten, which is the protein in flour. That's what gives you know, flours and bakes their wonderful elasticity, which is great when we're baking bread, but not what we're looking for when we're baking cakes. So it's important that as you fold in the flour, you do it carefully and slowly. It will get there, it takes time. And as I always say, the most important ingredient that you need to have to be a successful cake maker is patience. You'll know when you've reached the right stage because if you take the spatula right under the mixture, the batter right through the centre and you turn it over, it's still coming out perfectly clear that it's even all the way through. So now it's time to add the orange zest. I'm using the zest of two oranges with a microplane because that will ensure that the zest is really, really fine so you won't get any lumps of orange when it's baked into the cake and you get that wonderful essence and flavour of orange right the way through. It's such a wonderful synergy, chocolate and orange, it tends to suit most palates. I would always recommend adding the orange zest before you see whether or not you need any of the additional milk because you'll find that when you add orange zest it does tend to add extra moistness into the cake itself. So you see the benefit of using a microplane when you're zesting means that you are literally just taking off the very outer edge of the zest of the fruit and none of the more bitter pith that's underneath. If you stir that through, and again still maintaining that folding practice, round and cut through. Now in terms of dropping consistency or the consistency you're looking for, you should be able to lift up a spoonful and it should drop by the count of three. If it takes slightly longer, then add a little bit of milk. If it's coming off nice and easily, then you're fair to go. And it's worth remembering that raising agent, adding any kind of baking powder or chemical raising agent to a batter, means that as soon as it comes into contact with liquid, it will start reacting. So it's important that once you've added the self-raising flour and the baking powder to the batter, that you get it into the tin and into the oven fairly quickly. If the batter does look slightly dry, the raising agent won't work as well. So that's why if you add a little bit of that milk, you'll ensure that you're getting the maximum lift on the cake once it's in the oven. And that's ready for the tins. Now, if you wanted to be really precise at this stage, it's worth weighing the tins and then weighing the batter in so that you get even quantities in each tin, because that way you'll ensure that once one is baked, the other will be at exactly the same stage for baking. This helps you become a more professional cake maker. And use the back of the spatula to gently paddle the batter into position in the tin. Now these tins have been lined with 
baking parchment, so they're non-stick on the base. They're loose bottom tins, and I've brushed them all over with butter so this cake won't stick once it comes out of the oven. This one. The reason why you tend to have cakes that sometimes peak in the centre and are very shallow on the side would be if you haven't had ingredients at room temperature. If your butter's been too cold or the eggs have been too cold or you've rushed the process and haven't allowed for that full amount of creaming before you add all the ingredients, that's why you might get that peaking. If you do everything slowly, take your time, everything's at room temperature, you should find that you have a lovely even bake when these come out of the oven. And they're now ready for the oven, and they go in at 170 degrees for 25 minutes. A Swiss meringue buttercream starts by heating together the egg white and the sugar till it reaches a certain temperature so that the egg whites are cooked out and that's stable. And that's between 65 and 71 degrees. Then I'm going to transfer it into the whisk to create that lovely voluminous, gorgeous, silky meringue. I'm going to add unsalted butter that's just come off the chill, just taken it out of the fridge. And I've got melted dark chocolate. So this buttercream is wonderfully decadent, gorgeous, rich, chocolatey, velvety, but still has less sugar than if you were creating a normal, regular buttercream. Over my bain-marie, I'm going to start by putting the sugar in so that the egg white is not coming into contact with the hot bowl and then the egg white itself. It's really important to be careful when heating eggs because they're such a delicate structure, the egg white will set at a relatively low temperature so you have to manage that carefully using the bain-marie. And I'm going to use a balloon whisk just to bring those ingredients together to create a syrup. And you'll see that initially when it starts out, it's got a lot of colour in, it's opaque, but as that heats up, it will become more viscous. You'll start to feel it become slightly thicker and that sugar will dissolve and you're trying to create the right temperature where you've cooked the egg whites out, ready to create the stable meringue. It's really important to use a thermometer and you want to make sure that you take the temperature of the solution, the eggs and the syrup, not of the glass bowl. So hold it rather than rest it. Hold it so that it's actually touching the liquid and I'm looking for a temperature of between 65 and 71 degrees. And you don't have to be whisking it at this stage, it's just enough to make sure that the liquid is all the same, that the solution is all the same temperature throughout. So this is coming up from room temperature, so I'm at about 41 degrees. So I want to get up between 65 and 71. By that time, the egg white will be stable, the protein, and the sugar itself will have started to dissolve so that it creates a wonderful, smooth meringue with no sense of any gritty sugar inside the meringue. More importantly, by heating the egg whites at this stage and stabilising the protein, it means that you can add the additional fat of butter and chocolate without the meringue then collapsing by the weight of the fat inside. So once you kind of get to that 65 point, I just normally let it go for another 20-30 seconds to make sure that the whole liquid has reached that temperature and then you're ready to decant it into the bowl to create the meringue. Now this will be hot, so be careful as you lift it off. So with the meringue at the right temperature, decant that into the desktop bowl so that it can go in the mixer and that can do all the hard work. And you see at this stage, it really does just look like a, an eggy syrup and you'll wonder how it's ever gonna create this gorgeous meringue. But believe me, it does. Mm -hmm. 
and you want to let this happily whisk away now until it's light, it's aerated, it's a big, frothy, pillowy cloud of meringue. And if you hold the side of the bowl, you'll feel that as that temperature starts to come down, you're waiting for it to reach room temperature, and then you're ready to add the butter. As the meringue cools and thickens, you'll see that it goes a really beautiful viscosity. It's got wonderful glossiness to it, it looks thick and it's nice and stable. But don't rush this stage because when you start adding the butter, what you'll find that if it is still too warm or hasn't really reached this stage, the whole thing will loosen. So it's important not to rush it, let it cool, let it thicken and then slowly add the butter, which should be just sort of out of the fridge, a little bit starting to soften, but still relatively cool, so that you're not adding warm butter into a warm meringue. The coolness, the temperature of the butter being a bit cooler as it comes into the meringue will continue that cooling process. Now that the meringue has cooled, thickened, it's glossy, it's stable. We're going to start adding the butter just in small pieces at a time. So we're going to start incorporating into the meringue. And don't be concerned if you start to see it loosen before it comes back up to be nice and frothy and voluminous. I'm just going to stop and make sure that I scrape in that butter so that it's all added in before I continue to whisk it so that that's perfectly incorporated and again has thickened up, has stabilised, become a nice glossy buttercream meringue. I'm going to add the vanilla paste. This will add wonderful flavour to the buttercream. And I'm going to start to pour in my melted dark chocolate. This has been cooled first, so again, it won't heat the meringue any further. Oh my. You see, once that's all incorporated, you end up with the most delicious, rich, intense, velvety, but super light, buttery chocolate buttercream. It's as light as air, but it's got so much flavour and intensity. It's wonderful to use when you're layering cakes for piping on buttercreams. Um, and it's, it's stable, it will hold itself, it won't set and crust over. So it's wonderful for adding to gorgeous cakes and bakes. And that's how you make my chocolate Swiss meringue buttercream. When all the components are made, the fun part comes in being able to assemble the cake to bring it to life and create the show-stopping centerpiece. I've chilled my cake, so I've wrapped them in cling film, placed them in the fridge so that they're nice and firmed up. This will help that when I come to cut them in, in half, they will, they'll be nice and stable. To do that, I put my hand on the top and I use the blade to the side of the cake and I turn that so that the knife stays in position all the way around and I can slice the cake evenly in half. 
lift the top half off and you see you've got that wonderful crumb structure inside the cake and place that in position on the cake stand or the cake board where you're actually going to serve it. If you want to, you could actually just put a little bit of buttercream on the stand to hold the cake in position first. And there, press down. And then take that gorgeous orange curd and spoon that into the centre of the cake. Use the back of the spoon to spread it out and this will create that lovely mouthfeel of moistness and zingy orange flavour inside the cake. M literally melts into the sponge of the cake. And as that cake comes up to room temperature, that will just absorb that orange curd and be totally delicious and indulgent. And then put the top layer on top. And then I'm going to get my next cake ready at this stage so that as I layer it up with the buttercream, the top section is ready to go on. So repeat that with the second sponge. Cut it in half all the way around. Carefully slice through. Separate the top and layer with orange curd. I've filled a piping bag with a 2C nozzle. This is an open star. So this is going to create wonderful texture and pattern on the piping of how I apply the buttercream. In a large open piping bag, disposable one, spoon the buttercream inside. And you'll see it's lovely and soft, but it's still very stable. It holds its shape when it's hand piped. Fill it with as much as you can handle. All the sides up. Shake the meringue buttercream so that it comes inside. And then just give it a little massage almost to create uh, the opportunity for those air bubbles to release so that you're not going to end up with a big air pocket inside the bag. Press down, seal it, and then bring the buttercream to the edge so that it's all ready to pipe. And then bring the cake towards you on the stand. This is why it's important to have it on the stand first. And then holding the bag at a slight angle, start from the centre and then take the bag out to the end. Fill and bring it back in. Pipe, bring it back in. And just lip over the edge so that you create um, the, the design around the outside, which means that as you layer these tiers up, you'll see this edge of the buttercream gently, gently just nudging out. you're creating almost like a large daisy star design. To the center and then place the top sandwiched cake in position. Gently bring that out, press down and you'll see the natural weight of that cake will just cause those lovely scallops to peek out and then repeat that same piping on the top of the cake so in from the centre out to the edge. And it will help if you do have any little crumbs because this has been a soft cake. Any sort of edges that are not absolutely perfect will be masked as you pipe the buttercream around the edge. So the top tip here is making sure that you maintain an even pressure when you're piping. Ensure that you are moving fast enough or slow enough to, to ensure that you have a nice smooth pattern. It doesn't have to be completely perfect and uniform creating that homemade lovely finish on the cake. And then finish off with the last one in the middle. And once it's drawn back, then take some fresh berries and I've got here some gorgeous strawberries to dress the cake. even some little cake gooseberries. Peel them back and then just twist the edge to hold those up. And that highlights the fact that we've used fresh orange inside the cake. And I think you'll hopefully agree 
but that looks a pretty spectacular chocolate orange layered torte.